you are a B2B service-based business owner and you are looking to gain more clients, create more impact and more revenue in your business, tune in to Amplify Your Marketing Message with Christine Campbell Rappin. Every week, we're going to take you through how to build an audience of buyers, mastering your marketing message, and making offers that convert consistently. We'll see you all on the inside. Welcome back, everybody. Super excited to talk to you today about your environment and the space in which you create your amplification. It is everything. And so often we look at productivity really from the tasks and not from the space in which we create them. And that's why I'm super excited to introduce to you today an amazing human being, someone who has really changed the way we view the world and in fact, launched a industry that has created billions of dollars. Please give a very warm welcome to Barbara Hempel. She's my guest today. I'm super excited to have you with us today. This Thank is amazing. you, Christine. I love the word amplify. So when you uh, approached me about doing an interview, I said, yes, because I think amplify is such an important word for entrepreneurs. I totally agree because it is about building movement that leads to momentum and you have been a real catalyst to an industry i want you to introduce first off where did it all begin that you decided the world is missing a really simple part of the puzzle but without it we're spinning in circles tell us where it all began well i lived in india for almost five years and adopted three orphan children two three and four years old we moved to new york city my husband worked for a nonprofit and didn't make enough money to pay for living expenses so i needed to contribute uh, to our family income but i wanted to put my children first and i decided the way to do that would be to find a problem in the world that i could solve that people would pay me for so I sat on the playground and listened to people talking about what, what, they, what was troubling them, what they were struggling with. And I began to hear conversations about clutter and disorganization. And I thought, they didn't have my mother and dad. I grew up on a farm and uh, we grew up with systems. My mother was the personal assistant to the owner of a bank for 46 years. And so I just thought everybody knew how to put things in systems in order to get things done and found out that that wasn't true. So I took $7 out of the grocery money, which was a big deal because I used to walk 20 blocks because I didn't have 50 cents for the bus. And the ad said disorganized. I organized closets, files, kitchens, you name it, call Barbara Hemphill. And my first client was a 55 year old widow whose husband was an attorney. He had died very suddenly, left piles of paper. He was a an attorney, a solo practitioner who had left piles of paper everywhere. And his wife had no idea what was going on or whatever. And that was my first client. And to promote it, I would go and speak to churches and garden clubs and any place that would give me a platform. And it was based on the words, clutter is postponed decisions, which I learned from closed closets because closed closets fill up because you haven't decided whether you're going to lose the 10 pounds to get into that favorite pair of pants again, or the exercise equipment that looks so great on, on YouTube, or the candlesticks you got from Aunt Sally. You love Aunt Sally, but the candlesticks are not really your style. But if she came for Thanksgiving dinner, she'd be so excited if they were on the table. And I realized mm -hmm. that clutter was postponed decisions. And so my role was not to make, this is very, very important. My role is not to make the decision for the client, but to ask the question so the client can answer what they will do. You know, people often say, what should I do? And I say, that's the wrong question. The question is, what will you do? So that's how it all started. And I quickly learned that paper was the number one problem. And people ask, how long do you keep bank statements, expired insurance policies, uh, medical records? And I didn't know the answer, but I thought there must be a book at the library. And there wasn't. And so in 1988, I wrote the first book called Taming the Paper Tiger that addressed that issue. You know, I think that this is so key. I, I remember when I first heard it was a postponed decision and it lingered with me because 
we talk about business in my community. I'm helping business owners create bigger ripples to be impact driving. And one of the biggest things that I think is the outcome, the result of the work that I personally do with my clients is that you make better decisions more quickly and that you can navigate a changing landscape. And the reason we put things off, you said, like, I'm waiting to wear those clothes that I no longer fit. I'm waiting for that one occasion that if I can remember where it is, I'll put it out and make them feel special. You want to talk about now and the power of now and that it isn't a luxury to take care of the environment in which you're spending your passion, your conversations, and the way you show up in the world. Let's talk about today, now, and the fact we need to really shift our lens and make that decision. It's so true. There are people procrastinate about their environment, about clutter. Research shows for years we've used the Pareto principle, the 80-20. But Perry Marshall, one of my coaches, says it's now closer to 95-5, that it's really the 5% that really makes a difference. And with the things we have, whether it's the physical things in our office, the things in our files, the things in our computer, and most importantly, the things in our head. So when people come to me and talk about wanting to get rid of the clutter, one of the first things we say is 80% of this is changing your mindset to believe you can. There are so many people who say, well, you know, I, I've ADHD or I'm an artist or I'm just naturally disorganized. There's no hope for me. And that's just a lie. And so we need to say now to do it. And the reason now, because the older you get, the harder it is to do it. James Clear says in his book, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. And we use the acronym when it comes to information management, we use the acronym saving you space, time, energy, and money. Yes. Every time you have something that you repeat, whether it's file your taxes or uh, start a new marketing plan, you need to have a system. And so that's what we're always helping people do. And the older you get, the harder it is to develop those systems, and more importantly, those habits. And an example I use is I'm married to a man who's incredibly disorganized. He's a retired army colonel, and I thought, oh, he'd be very organized. Well, I realized he had privates, so he isn't organized. <laughs> so in our family, we've been married 38 years, he would give me something and he would say, file this for me. Eh, no problem. I'm the one who manages this, so I'd file it. And a week or a month or several years later, he would say, I gave you such and such. And I would have no recollection I mean, in the beginning. I, oh, yeah, I remember. Well, now I'm age 77 and he'll he'll say that and I'll say, I have no recollection of your having given me that. But if you did, I have a system and I know where it is and I will go to that system either for paper or for digital. And sure enough, it's there because it's a system and it's habits. So now is the time to do it. Because the older you get, the harder it's going to get. And people ask the question, how long is this going to take and how much is it going to cost? And my answer at first is, I don't know, because I don't know exactly what you need and what you're willing to do. But what I can tell you for absolute sure, based on thousands of clients, is the longer you wait, the longer it's going to take and the more it's going to cost in lost opportunities. I love this. I remember the empower of systems. And truthfully, when I've started every iteration and level of growth in my business, I've always hired people to say, talk to me about how you run your system. Doesn't mean I'm duplicating 100% of it. But so I can see how they think so that as it grows, it doesn't spin out of control, it has a system of control. And I rarely early in my career, I built a website, I was hired as a startup, I was hired into a founding startup of five people. And I was the marketing person and we were building a website. It's mind boggling now, but this was 1996. We built a thousand pages before we launched it, seriously. <gasps> and we built it with post-it notes on a glass wall. And we built the system of the naming convention of the way we would, we would run almost like a decision tree. And it made things systemic and so easy because when we were like unsure of something, we had different shapes, 
and different sizes. And we said our job is to stay within the framework as we are thinking this through because we had no other way to build it. And yet, to this day, one of the very first things I go back and do is say, let's talk about the systems. And I have several clients of mine right now that this is the key priority of 2024. I don't have an SOP. I don't have any way for somebody to step into my business if I walked out because I was not able to do it. Or if my children needed me, I said, we have to have a system in place that somebody else could find your way through your brain because it is the single most important thing as a solopreneur. If you do not want to immediately kill your revenue, if life happens, and guess what, my friends? Life is a way of happening. Absolutely. So I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. See it as an investment. Now is the time. It's harder as you have more stuff, and it's harder as we're getting older. I loved also what you said in this story with your husband, though. It's just the key thing. It's only valuable to keep if you know what you have and you can access it quickly. Let's talk about it, this. I call it Hemphill's principle. If you don't know you have it or you can't find it, it is of no value to you. And the more you keep, the less you use, either because you don't remember you have it or you can't find it. I mean, one of the, the things that we do for companies that is my favorite thing to do of all the services we offer, this one makes the biggest impact in the shortest amount of time on the most number of people. And we call it a productive environment day, or sometimes we call it a productivity party, depending on the culture. In the government, it's a productive environment day. Uh, <laughs> if it's in a, in a more entrepreneurial setting, we call it a, a productivity party. And it's a day event, which is clearing clutter. And prior to the event, we set up a shredding station, a recycling station, trash to treasure. That's where you put the personal items, you know, coffee mugs and flower vases and books and things. And then the most important is a staging area. And a staging area is where employees can say, this is in my office, but I don't need it and I don't know what to do with it. And so then it can go in the staging area. And we offer prizes for the funniest thing, the oldest thing, the most valuable thing, the most worthless thing, et cetera. And we start the day with a seminar called Sometimes It Takes an Expert to Take Out the Trash. And then we tell them, OK, you have one job today and one only, and that is to go in your office, go through every item in it, pick it up and say, does this help me accomplish my work or enjoy my life? And if it doesn't, by definition, it's clutter and you can't afford it. And now they have a place to put it. And it is amazing. And it start, employees start with, oh, I don't want to throw away anything and I have real work to do. So I asked the question, <laughs> how many of you left home with more clutter lying around than you prefer? Well, 50 percent will raise their hands. Statistically, it's true for 80 percent. And so then I say everything we're going to learn today applies at home. Well, as, as it would be, what they mostly think about what they're going to tell their significant other, right? <laughs> so I make them raise their hand and take a pledge that they will listen for what they're going to do, not what they're going to tell somebody else to do. And it is amazing what happens. Recently, we had a client, it was a law firm that had been in business for over 40 years. And many companies have gone paperless, but they haven't dealt with the paper before paperless. So they have attics and storage, off storage units and things like that. And who who goes to work and says, oh, I don't think better to date today. I'm going to I'm going to clean out the files. And in those in the case of a law firm, some of those documents have to be kept. So they had to go through them. So we did it. And at the end of the day, uh, the attorney said, I cannot believe how much we accomplished. And what always happens if people say, I'm going home and clean out my attic, I'm going home and clean out my garage. Because when people understand how to make decisions, and most importantly, when they understand what impacts it is the emotion. One of the things I learned early, I was autographing books at Barnes & Noble. And I made the comment that when I worked with people who had difficulty letting go, if I ask enough questions without exception, I would find that they had experienced a severe emotional loss in their life. When I was done, a young man, probably in his middle 20s, came up to me and he said, my apartment in New York is full of stuff, mostly paper, and I haven't had anybody in it for months. And he said, I come home from work at night and I say, okay, tonight's the night I'm going to clean this up. 
And he said, I pick up the piece of paper. And he said, I literally become physically paralyzed. And he said, the biggest flat surface I have is my bed. And he said, some nights I literally crawl into bed with my paper. And then he looked at me and he said, my mother died when I was six. Are you telling me that I have to deal with the grief of losing my mother before I can handle my paper? And I said, well, I'm not a mental health professional, so I can't answer that. But what I can tell you from my experience is that if you find someone you trust, probably not a family member, who can help you decide what you want and need to keep, because organizing is an art. It doesn't have a right or wrong reason. If you can figure out what's important to you, it will solve your paper problem and it will have an impact on your other emotions as well. Well, I was speaking to a group of 700 executive women at a university and I told that story and a woman walked up to me and she said, well, you just saved my marriage. And I said, wow, that's pretty dramatic. What do you mean? And she said, I came here with the intent of telling my husband to whom I've been married for 13 years that I was leaving because he's a pack rat and I have allergies and the house is full, she said. And then she started, literally the tears started to run down her face. She said, I never understood until I heard you that it wasn't that he wouldn't get rid of it, but that he couldn't. His mother died when he was seven. I said, may I make a suggestion? She says, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm willing to try it again. I said, may I make a suggestion? And she said, of course. And I said, go home and say something to the effect of, I never understood before how important all this is to you. Let's figure out how you can keep it and we can still live together. I stayed in touch with them for about eight months afterwards. It totally changed the dynamics because mm -hmm. one of the things that always happens is that more someone says, you don't need that, the more they hang on to it and they didn't feel heard. And he felt heard. And so then he would begin to say, well, this collection, we can just take a picture of it. And it made a big difference. I think this is such an interesting insight because you've talked about, it's not what you should, it's what you will. Mm -hmm. Can you or can't you? And understanding that that is all still a decision framework. And I love that you also talk about this is you can have someone help you think this through. I think thinking partners are the, some of the biggest ways that we can amplify what we're doing in life because we can see a different lens. Their job is not to criticize. Their job is to sit side by side us and say, we are in this together. And you have a real philosophy that team is important in this journey. And you've just shared an illustrative story in that way. But together, we are better. Talk to us about that concept. Well, when I started my business as a solopreneur, of course, I didn't, the industry didn't exist. So it wasn't like I could go look at what somebody else was doing and figure out how I could do it differently or better. I just had to make it up. But I knew in my heart of hearts that I could not do it alone. And I named my company Barbara Hemphill Associates. And I, I joked and said my first associate was my hairdresser. Because the main reason, the, the main way I got clients was through speaking engagements. And if my hair didn't look good, I couldn't give a speech. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was a bookkeeper because I, I mean, I had a music, I was a music major. I knew nothing about business. And so I signed up at the local community college for a course on accounting. I lasted for two days. I had no idea what was going on. And I left and I said, okay, if I have to know this, there's no hope for me. And I immediately hired a bookkeeper. So I live always having people. And before I even had any income, I had a bookkeeper because I knew that that was something I couldn't do. Um, we, and I personally, although I've been in the organizing and productivity business for over 40 years, I still hire people in my own profession because it's very difficult to see yourself you have your own emotion and people are there to facilitate and to support you. And my mother used to say on the farm, many hands make light work. And I remember one of my first clients, I was in Washington, D.C. for 15 years. And one of my clients was an astrophysicist. And we were in, the, in his garage cleaning out boxes and boxes of paper. 
And he was laughing and he stopped and he looked at me and he said, if anybody would have ever told me that I would be laughing, cleaning out the garage, I'd have told them they were crazy. But it is so much easier. And here's the thing I want to stress. Get help sooner rather than later, because if you wait, I mean, somebody think, oh, well, I'm too embarrassed. I mean, one of the things our company developed, we were one of the first organizing and productivity companies to offer virtual consulting. We did that way before COVID, which was a huge blessing because when COVID came and everybody was trying to organize their home office, we could do it virtually. We've been doing it for years. But people often were embarrassed. They were shamed. I mean, they're successful people and I don't want people to see my mess. And the other thing that came out of it that was really unanticipated and wonderful is that because people learn kinesthetically, if we help them virtually and they have to physically file the things, they learn better, faster and quicker. So it turned out to be a really positive thing. But what will happen is people will think I've got to get this in order before I hire somebody and you end up doing things that never needed to be done in the first place. Because one of our major principles is today's mail is tomorrow's pile. So when, when we work with a client, the first thing we do is we ignore everything they did in the past and we are going to stop the problem by putting in a system to stop the problem. And we have, we have a series of boot camps that we do one for paper and one for digital. And we always say at the end of this boot camp, and if you've got decades worth of stuff, the boot camp is four or five weeks long, you're not going to get 14 years worth of stuff, but we'll guarantee three things. One, you will know what to do with every new piece of information that comes in because you now have a system. Two, that everything we have filed in the time we work together, you or anyone else in your company or family can find it in seconds because you have a system. And three, that will leave you with what we call a productive environment game plan, which says this is what you need to do in order to continue the process. And we guarantee that because it's worked and we've done it thousands of times. And when we put systems in place, I have systems that I put in for people literally two and three decades ago, and they are still using it because it's adapted to what they will and need to want to do. And I love this. That's why I see so many parallels between the work that you are doing in your space and the work that we do within ours, because it is about foundations. It is about laying the systems to be able to handle the real world of all the data inputs that are coming at you for you to look at them assess them, decide if they're clutter, or are they creating value or joy, which is what you had mentioned. And if so, what are we going to do with it? Make a decision and move. And I love the parallels that we see. You are a very successful woman in business. You've been in this industry and created an entire world that didn't exist. I don't think in any way, shape, and formal ways before you. What's working for you right now in your business to grow your business and expand the reach of the work you're doing? Well, one of my beliefs is that great leaders create great cultures. And this area of clutter applies in every single industry, in personally, professionally. So one of the things I'm doing now is connecting with leaders in different industries to say, how can we apply what I know to your industry? So for example, I have an interview scheduled with the founder of the London Contemporary School of Music. And I'm a musician and music is my saving grace. If I'm in some bad place, all I have to do is turn on music and in seconds I'll be fine. And he teaches people, I play the piano, but it's all with the notes. If I don't have the notes, I can't play anything. Well, he has a whole new way of teaching. So he's changing the industry of music education. So I'm loving to connect with people in different industries to say, how do we collaborate just like you and I are doing? Because there's such a parallel. Every entrepreneur has systems that work for them, but a lot of leaders have not thought about the negative impact of clutter. And I want to introduce that into their industry and then they'll be able to go farther and they will imp improve others. Our tagline is accomplish your work and enjoy your life and enable others to do the same. 
And that's why I think you're an awesome human being. Guys, it has been an absolute pleasure. Please connect with Barbara. This is such an important conversation. Your environment fuels your profitability and it is about taking stock. It isn't about more. We already know the world is going to create more because we are a consumer driven space. But what I want you to do is create the space to be awesome. I want you to create the space to amplify your message and I want you to get help along the way and I want you to consider working with Barbara and her team. So please go find her. Barbara, thank you for being our guest today. Everyone, we will see you all on our next episode. We'll see you Thank then. you, Christine. You're welcome. That's a wrap on another amazing episode of Amplify Your Marketing Message with me, your host, Christine campbell Rappin. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss another great episode. And be sure to visit christinecampbellrappin.com slash podcast to get a free resource on how to master your marketing message. We'll see you all on our next episode.